And for out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of Jehovah from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples, and shall decide for strong nations who are far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. They shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of Jehovah Salawat has spoken. That's, you often hear the translated as the Lord of hosts. For all the people walk each in the name of its God, but we shall walk in the name of Jehovah our God forever and ever. Well, in the first place, you're going to say that this prophecy that we hear in Isaiah and again in Micah is not talking about earthly stuff. It's not talking about an earthly Jerusalem. It's not talking about um, an earthly hill. It's talking about a heavenly Jerusalem, which from the Galatians, in chapter 4, verse 22, says this, heavenly Jerusalem is our spiritual mother. This heavenly Jerusalem is our spiritual mother, from which we are nurtured. God is not speaking here to literal Jerusalem. He's not talking about the law of Moses. That's very clear, because, in fact, the law of Moses did not go forth from Jerusalem. It did not come from the hill called Mount Zion. It went from Mount Sinai in the desert. But what happened in Jerusalem in 33 AD that established a new covenant and a new law? crucifixion, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. Jesus died for our sins on the cross. He was resurrected from the dead and ascended to God the Father. A new law is now in effect. And it went forth from Jerusalem, from Mount Sinai. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 makes it clear that where verse 3 of our reading today says, many people shall come and say, come let us go to the Mount of the Lord. It's not talking about a physical city. It's not talking about Jerusalem in Palestine. It's not talking about it at all. It's not talking about the tallest hill in the Armenian sector of the city today, where the temple used to sit. Which is, by the way, Mount Zion. That's the name of that hill. What it is talking about is the spiritual new Jerusalem, which is the heavenly Mount Zion, which we see described in Revelation chapter 21. The prophet Isaiah, he was living in a terrible time for the people of God. This is not a time of all sweetness and light for the people of Israel and of Judah. It is not. See, God's plan, as revealed, was to establish this kingdom. And Jerusalem was to be the capital of the kingdom from which a true king would come forth who would be the savior of his people. And this king was going to accomplish great things during his life in Jerusalem where it said, we're told, that he would be crucified and rise from the dead. This is about 700 years, by the way, before the king was born. That this prophecy was born. And what had happened is this people got tired. Wow, isn't this way it always happens? We get tired of waiting on God. <laughs> and so we try to do stuff ourselves. We try to get ahead of God and do things for Him. Well, how many times in my life God said, I want you to do this. I go, I got it. Zoom it off. I got it. I want you to do it over there. And I've run out ahead of him and I've gotten in trouble now. He has to rescue me again. Again and again. So the people of God turned away from him because he didn't act in the manner they thought was timely. They went to false gods for help because God's help did not arrive on their timetable. King Ahaz even went to Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, for help because God didn't do what he wanted. And you know the story. Because of their sins, God handed over his people to their enemies. He said, okay, fine. We're going to go my way, have it your way. And the 
Enemies occupied their territory, worshipped idols in their temple, carried off the women and children into captivity, and things were bad. And Isaiah comes to him. And he has his prophecy. The people of, of God, of Israel, and Israel were scattered, they were conquered and both. And in this gloomy setting, Isaiah receives this vision of the city of Jerusalem, Mount Zion, the Temple Mount, as the center of all hope and all prosperity and of peace, to which all the peoples of the world would come. But God is not talking about a physical mountain or a physical temple. This prophecy, this which Isaiah saw, was not talking about the temple was torn down 70 years after the death of Christ. Because here's the truth. Wherever the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed, wherever God's love is shared, there is the temple of God. There is Mount Zion. There is the holy city of Jerusalem being lived in right there. Wherever the message of our crucified Lord is proclaimed and God's means of grace are shared, there is the holy mountain. You see, this vision that Isaiah saw 3,000 years ago almost is being fulfilled in front of your eyes. It's happening now. This is not Someday, it is here now. It's not complete, it's not finished. There's more still to happen, but it is taking place. And here's what makes the mountain of God so amazingly wonderful. It's what makes it so much better than any other mountain of religion, any other mountain of politics, either mountain of philosophy, or mountain of finance and money, or towering buildings what looks like amazing Western civilization, what makes it so much better, so much different, is nothing less than the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what makes it so cool. This Christ who brings about peace and brings peace and forgiveness to the sinner. This Christ who brings forgiveness to the convicted. This Christ who brings healing to the hurting and even brings life to the dead. And so for some of you, you and I, we have come to this mountain of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 24 says it like this. It says, You have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom, and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet, and a voice whose words made the hearers beg, and no further messages be spoken from him. For they could not endure the order that was given. If a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, was so terrifying the sight that even Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of that living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The Apostle Peter calls us living stones in the temple of God. To, as you come to him, who is a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves are being built up like living stones. You're being built up as a spiritual house, as a royal priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. <coughs> For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will never be put to shame. As the church of God, Great and glorious above all other mountains in the world, above all other religions, all other philosophies, all other ways of life, 
or any achievement to which you might turn to someone else for help, or any other so-called good thing, as the Church of God, we have this unique relationship and a unique responsibility. See, the Mount of the Lord's Temple, this is the source of the true knowledge of salvation. The mission of our church is fundamentally at its core one of evangelism, a mission of teaching other people for the purpose of bringing them to that same salvation. We have a unique position, I think, in the world of being this source of the true knowledge of salvation. And I think that as this church, as we, carry out this mission of proclaiming the gospel and sharing the sacraments, it will be successful. The church will be successful. And we will see the truth of the fact that all nations shall flow to it. People from all nations. In chapter 60 of the book of Isaiah, the prophet um, describes God's kingdom in these last days. The same last days he speaks of in verse 2 of our reading today, he's describing them in chapter 60. He says, Arise, shine. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord shall arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. The Apostle John, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. He says, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth to every nation and tribe and language and people. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. I love God's word. It says, After this I looked and behold a multitude that no one could number. From every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, they cry out a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. Wherever, wherever God's church, wherever we worship God in spirit and in truth, proclaiming the gospel to those to whom we are sent, there, there on that spot, in that moment, is the mountain of God's presence. Is the holy city of New Jerusalem being lived into in this world and being established for anyone and everyone to see. And where it is not, it is invisible. Remember the words of Jesus in John chapter 12, where he said, And I, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. There's that lifted up piece that we tend to forget about. But the result, the result of this proclamation of the gospel will, yes, be great in numbers, and will be, but also will be great in the lives of God's people. What will happen then in the lives of God's people when the mountain of God, the holy Jerusalem, the new Mount Zion is established as you and I share the gospel? It says, he will decide between the nations, judge between the nations and decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. These are instruments not of war and conflict, but of growth and of prosperity. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn more and more. And these verses, by the way, are not talking about the world in general. It's not talking about all the nations of the planet. It's not. It's talking about the nations and the people who come to Mount Sinai. It's talking about not the political entities of the world, but about the people of God. What shall Reign amongst us is not conflict and difference, but unity. 
Because Matthew 24, 7 says that in the outer part of the world, in the rest of the world, says nation will, will rise against the nation and kingdom against kingdom. Sharp contrast here between the people of God and those who are not of God. And these same nations that are talked about in verse 4, who are from the people of God from all over, who come together, who come like a flood to the Lord, what else describes it. These are nations of believers in Jesus Christ. These are a multitude of people from every possible group of people you can imagine who have faith in God and have come to sit at the feet of the Lord to learn His ways. To learn His law of love. Think about this. See, this worship and learning from God, it's going to have an effect. It's going to change people's lives. It's going to change your life. At least it should. Think about this. How do you settle your differences? Think about this. How do you settle your differences? In the world, we're settled by fighting and by war, by money, by a cold shoulder, by shunning, by lawyers, by lawsuits. But how do we settle our differences? What is our standard for judging between right and wrong? Between sin and forgiveness? Is it not the word of God? Is it not the law of love that becomes our standard? Is it the law of reconciliation? We're supposed to be selling our differences by the word of God. We're supposed to be living in the kingdom of God according to his word alone as a standard for right and wrong, standard for right belief and for moral behavior. As we grow closer to God and we spend time living on His holy mountain, as people who trust in Him and learn from His Word, sit at His feet and learn His law, our lives will then naturally and automatically, almost, begin to reflect His will in the world around us, which is to, of course, then share the gospel. Before Jesus was crucified, he reminded his disciples of something. He gave them something. He'd given them before, but he made it very intact. He said to his disciples, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. And after the resurrection, when he appeared to the disciples repeatedly, he almost always began by saying, Peace be with you. God's people on God's holy mountain, our lives should be characterized by peace. This should be the underlying foundation of our relationships, filled with peace, both within and without. With the barrier of sin between man and God broken down by the sacrifice of Christ, so too is the barrier of sin between you and I, or between us and anybody else, also broken down, lacking only the word of peace, lacking only forgiveness for peace to reign. And then confession and forgiveness and peace and this life in Christ become part of the conversation, part of the life. Indeed, the very bedrock of the life of the people of God living on God's holy mountain. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 9 speak of this. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge men by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but rather with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. And the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. 
The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the lean child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Brothers and sisters, 